Well, hello, my name is Zach Hill, and I am a pastor and teaching elder here at Silver City Church in Mount Sterling, Kentucky. Uh, I am thankful that you have come across this content, either by intention or accident or via someone sharing it for you or with you on social media. Uh, my prayer is that this video and this content edifies you and refines your walk with Christ. Uh, I want to personally reach out to you and greet you before you watch this content and also to say a, a few prefatory words. Uh, the first one is this, unless you are a member at Silver City Church, I am not your pastor. And I say that in love. Unless you are a member at Silver City Church, I am not your pastor. In a age that is hyper-connected via social media and the internet, you can have uh, individuals that uh, listen to solid teaching from solid pastors and they simply latch on to those people and never join a church and say that those men are their pastors. And this is frankly false. Uh, I am not your pastor unless you are a member at Silver City Church. Secondly, it would be this. If you are being edified by this material and this content and want to join us at Silver City Church here in the central Kentucky, eastern Kentucky area, please go to silvercityky.com and view our location and our times. We would love to have you come join us on a Lord's Day. Uh, thirdly, if you are being edified by this and do not have a church home and you're outside the area, still contact us on our website and we will see if we can't plug you into a place in your location that can uh, shepherd you and edify you. Uh, if through this content or similar content connected to it, you uh, have been convicted of your sins and have repented for the first time and Christ is your Lord and Savior and He is Lord, Lord of all, uh, would you please reach out to us? We would love to uh, talk to you about that and give you material and send you uh, on a path of righteousness. Godspeed and we pray His kingdom come. Thanks again for watching. So, how many of us, speaking about music, thinking about music, how many of us have ever been to a concert? Raise a hand, poll. How many of you have ever been to a concert? Pretty much everybody has been to a concert. So, have you ever stopped and thought why human beings in the modern age, 2022 and back, why we pay money to watch other human, human beings play instruments and sing? It's odd, isn't it? Why do we do that? With the invention of radio and television and internet streaming, all of this stuff, music is now available at our fingertips and rising stars are no longer discovered on, well, this is going to sound pretty dated, American Idol. They're no longer discovered there or in some obscure part of like Vienna where Mozart was from, like this kid that's a prodigy. No, they're no longer discovered like that. They're discovered on TikTok. Lord, please ban that too. Music while entertaining, while it's entertaining, music always carries a message. Every single song that you've ever heard carries a message, especially those with lyrics. And music at its core, at its core is not actually about entertainment. It's actually not about entertainment. We use it for everything, right? We use it to kill time when we're in the car. We use it to put it on uh, like the dentist and doctor's office loudspeakers because we can't live in an age with silence. We use it for our televisions. We use it while we're cooking. We use it for everything. It's a part of us. And if you think about it, music, when we speak, that's music. We have this vibration and these two things in our throat, these vocal cords, and it produces a tone. And some people's tones are better than others. Music and song, at their core, they're fundamental forms of teaching. They speak about something. What comes out of us in song signifies what we believe to be true. We praise what we partake of. We sing what we find sanctifying. If we only think of music and song as entertainment, we miss the fact that music is a gift from God that He has used from the very beginning to unite us to Himself and to remind us of who He is, what He has done, and what He is doing. As we begin this season of Advent, we're going to be 
tuning in or observing, listening to a, a royal and divine concert. And this concert comes in four acts. And each of these acts come with a song that teach us something that we need to know. Jesus Christ. Come and behold. Come and welcome Jesus Christ. So this morning as we begin this, my prayer is that we will, from this day forward, and maybe you're already there, but from this day forward, lean less toward viewing music and song as entertainment, something that we pump in our ears while we're working out, something that we pump in our ears while we're at work. If you're not allowed to do that, stop. Right? We need to hear the message. Viewing music as a form of teaching, viewing music as a form of bringing a message that we need to recognize nothing is neutral. Everything either glorifies God or says something else. This is the message that we have before us this morning that we need to hear in our ears each day. That we who have been saved by the life of Christ, His death, His burial, His resurrection, His ascension, that we sing songs of praise unto God, from God, using not our own words that we make up along the way, but His. This is one reason why we sing psalms so prevalently, prevalently here at Silver City. So let us set the stage this morning. Behold, Act 1. Right? Act 1, which centers around the song of a lowly peasant girl, no doubt taunted and jeered and thought to be immoral. Let's examine and sing the song of Mary this morning. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Luke chapter 1? Luke chapter 1. One of the longest chapters in the entire Bible. Luke chapter 1. We're going to be in verses, one, all right, hold your breath, y'all. 1 through 56. 1 through 56. Luke chapter 1, 1 through 56. And as we go through this scripture, I'm going to do this a little differently. Um, I'm going to kind of loosely exposit the text before the song that we're going to be looking at today. So we understand, so we're there together, we get the context, so we don't just plop right in and hear the song of Mary. And so this morning, I want you to open your hearts, hear this heavenly song, and realize that it is magnificent because it speaks of magnificent things. Luke 1, 1 through 56. Hear the word of God. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that, we have, been that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word uh, have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some times past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty among the things you have been taught. Luke, our, our author, is doing investigative journalism. All right? He has been commissioned by this man named Theophilus. We don't know who he is. Uh, he's been given money to compile an account, a narrative about all this Christian stuff that that Theophilus now believes. Theophilus is a Christian, and he wants to understand his faith more. Okay, here we go. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were, born, they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now remember, children, the fruit of the womb, are a heritage from the Lord. And many times in Scripture, a barren womb was a sign of judgment. Can you imagine Zechariah and Elizabeth walking righteously before the Lord their whole life thinking, what have we done wrong? What have we done wrong? Oh, but also God's sovereignty sometimes he will give us what looks like judgment so that on the other side, we see that it is His outworking of providence for His glory and something even greater. Amen? Now, while he was serving as priest, verse 8, before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen to, by lot to enter the temple of the Lord to burn incense. In second. Uh, I believe it's Second Chronicles. Um, God, I'm sorry, David 
takes the priesthood and kind of divides them up because there's so many. And um, they worked in the temple pretty much two weeks a year is how it worked out. So this was the time of year that Zechariah would have worked in the temple as a priest in the lineage of Aaron. It's his two-week stint. He gets chosen by a lot, which was some nice dice, to go into the temple and burn incense. This was a big deal. He may never burn incense again in his life. And a lot of priests, some of them would get chosen to wash the utensils. This was a big deal. This wasn't going into the Holy of Holies, but he was in the, the, the most holy place, but he was in a holy place burning incense. Big deal. The whole multitude of the people were praying outside at that hour of incense because the incense represented the prayers of the people going up to God. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Gabriel is pronouncing what is known as a Nazarite vow upon young John before he's even born here. I mean, he's set apart and holy to the Lord. He's set apart for a special task. This is the only child in Scripture, the only child in Scripture that is referred to as being filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb. We should pray that our children would be the same, that they would be set apart by God from their conception for a holy task unto Him. Lost my place. And many, yeah, verse 16, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedience to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. This was the last prophecy of the Old Testament in Malachi 4. This was it. This is what they had been waiting for for 400 and some years of silence. After Malachi said this, here it is, Zechariah. This is the time. You're a part of it. And Zechariah, verse 18, said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. Oh, wow. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. It didn't take but like two minutes to light all that incense. What's going on? And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple and he kept making signs saying that he was uh, mute. Right? And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. So he was there at the temple for maybe two weeks. Maybe this was the beginning. Maybe this was a couple days in. He was there silent, and Elizabeth didn't know what was going on. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Oh, Elizabeth has a providential view of God. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. Betrothal was not engagement like we think it is. You've heard some preachers say that, oh, it was like, it's like the engagement stage. No, it wasn't. Engage, and when you're engaged, you can go like this. Wedding's off, right? Betrothal was pretty much the part of the wedding ceremony where you said your vows and there was a whole year where you had this vow testing pretty much and you lived separate from the one that you were betrothed to. This wasn't, this wasn't engagement. This was much more. This was like the last step before you may now kiss the bride. Okay? And Gabriel came to her, verse 28, and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, 
for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Isaiah 9 that we just read this morning. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Pause. Zechariah said the same thing, didn't he? How is this going to happen? And he gets judged with muteness. He, he asked the same thing Mary asked. How is this? How? You know what? Why? Because this is a little jab. This is God's humor. Zechariah, what do you mean, Zechariah? How are you going to have a son, even though your wife's old? Um, oh, Zach, do you know how babies are made? Go do the process. Trust in the Lord. Mary says, how will this be? I'm a virgin. That is a good question. Let me tell you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and overshadow you. This is a direct reference back to Genesis 1 when the Spirit of the Lord is hovering over the face of the waters right before creation happens. The Holy Spirit is hovering over Mary as if she is this void earth and something, is, something amazing, something magnificent, you could say, is about to happen. And behold, verse 36, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has, been, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month of her uh, with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Verse 39, in those days... Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, and why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and, the, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped the ser his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as, his, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remains with her about three months and returned to her home. Thus says the living word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this beautiful large chunk that tells us to get ready. You give us signs and you give us wonders in the scripture. Let our hearts prepare him room. And would we be your servants saying, let it be done to us as you have said. We pray that you would give us illumination. We pray that our hearts would receive the implanted word and that we would be carried along by the same Holy Spirit who breathed out the scriptures we read this morning, the same Holy Spirit that, that carried along Elizabeth and John and that overshadowed Mary. And we pray this in his power and in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 As we come to verse 39 of chapter 1, we come to the song of Mary, the song of Mary. Mary, the young virgin with child, she goes to see her relative Elizabeth, the old and barren with child as well. Dr. Luke, he was a doctor, is a wonderful inspired writer who throughout this portion of his investigative journalism, if you want to call it, highlights many parallels. 
It's not just random. Here, here's one of them. Here's a parallel. Uh, a lowly peasant girl who responds faithfully to Gabriel and the esteemed priestly man who responds in disbelief. We've got this, this compare and contrast, this juxtaposition. Here's another one. In the book of, uh, when we're seeing about the priesthood, and there's this divvying out of the various tribes of the priesthood, the one that Zechariah comes from, Abijah, do you know what the priest tribe that comes after him is? Joshua. And that is the name of Jesus Christ. We start to see all of these things coming together. Jesus' is name, Jesus, uh, Jesus, is a Greek translation of the Hebrew name, Yehoshua, Joshua. Joshua comes after this. Huh. In 139, we see Mary coming to her relative's home. We see that when Mary comes in and greets that family, Elizabeth is said to be carried along by the Holy Spirit. She begins to speak words of prophecy or speak words of praise about Mary. It would seem that the mother of the greatest human prophet of all time, Christ himself, John, was the greatest prophet, is carried along by the Holy Spirit to have him, John, in her womb, hear his mother voice be a megaphone for God's word. Elizabeth speaks enough for her and old silent Zechariah. She exclaims to Mary, her poor peasant relative, this young girl, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now this is quite odd if we consider what's going on here. Again, we must remember in Hebrew society, and even the society of God within the church to a degree, we see how we greet one another. This is an older relative blessing the younger relative as if she is some high esteemed princess. Mary should have been the one honoring her elder relative. And yet it's the elder relative who honors and praises the young Mary, and not in private, but loudly for all to hear. She cries out just like her son John would do in the wilderness, preparing the way of God in the flesh. Elizabeth speaks such a wonderfully humble message unto Mary. Why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? That the mother of my Lord? Elizabeth marveled more at the fact that she was chosen by the sovereign will of God to receive and care for the very girl who would miraculously give birth to the Savior of the whole world over and against the gift of another miraculous child that she was carrying in her own womb. Pause right here, Christian. Elizabeth in this moment, before the Christ child was even born, was overwhelmed with a sense of awe and grace. She felt so unworthy to be a part of this. Why is it granted to me to do this? And yet we live on the other side of this redeeming grace. We live on the other side of this child become man, become sacrifice, become king. We have that promise fulfilled. How much more should we, whom he has called into salvation, exclaim and cry aloud, filled with joy, filled with this same Holy Spirit, why is it granted to me? Why is it granted to me to have this wonderful gift of salvation? Why is it granted to me this salvation that comes from the fruit of this womb of Mary? Elizabeth goes on in verse 44, that when she heard the sound of Mary's voice, the baby in her womb leapt with joy. If Elizabeth would have been alive today, she would have been scolded that, don't you know that's just a clump of cells? That's not a baby. The scriptures speak of life from conception before conception. We see this beautiful announcement that this is a baby. It's not something that becomes a baby once it's outside the birth canal. I love what R.C. Sproul says about this portion of Elizabeth's honoring of Christ. Listen to what he says right here. Elizabeth is blessing Mary 
because of the child she carries. She blesses the Lord. Filled with God's Spirit from his mother's womb, John begins his prophetic testimony to Christ even before his birth. His mother's voice and words give this loud significance of the leap inside of her. John's already talking about Jesus before he's even outside of the womb. Elizabeth concludes her honoring of Mary by this. Unknowing that a song is about to arise out of this young girl, Elizabeth blesses Mary in a somewhat, you could say, kind of tongue-in-cheek way. We miss this in Scripture. We talk about it all the time. We put this holy veneer over it like it's, oh. No, God has humor. There is satire, and there's even satire right here in Luke 1. We miss this if we just gloss it over. All right? Think about what Elizabeth says, and think about where Mary is. There, she's in Elizabeth and Zechariah's home. What can Zechariah do? He can hear, but he can't speak. And blessed is she who believed, Zach. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of the word spoken to her. Zechariah is probably in the other room going, <laughs> right? Right, Zach? Because here's the thing. Blessed is she who believed. Zechariah's name means God remembers, and he failed to remember the promises of God. But his wife didn't. And here, right in the most unexpected place of Scripture, we expect right here, okay, blessed is she who has believed in this fulfillment. Boom, we go right into like some sort of birth narrative. Here Jesus is. Woo! The most unexpected thing happens. It's like a most unexpected journey of a hobbit leaving the Shire to go out into Middle Earth. Hobbits don't do that. They like their pipe weed and their cheese and their bread. What happens? A song comes forth. A song comes forth in a home of a first century Palestinian old couple from a young peasant girl. And it's a song that has echoed from eternity past to today, and it will echo on into the future. Mary sings this song, not for entertainment. Thank you so much. Let me give you a little sum of this right here. No, she sings in praise. Her praise is nothing but the teaching of God himself oozing back out of her. Her message in song is not her own because nothing about this situation is her own. In Luke 1.46, beginning there, no doubt guided by the Holy Spirit, Mary breaks out in this song. Before we even examine this song, let, let's notice that she only speaks about herself four times. She says, my soul, my spirit, me blessed, great things for me. And these four instances really have nothing to do with her. She's not even talking about herself. They're magnifying the gracious, saving, world-changing, powerful, merciful love of God. Her speaking of herself comes at the onset of the song and then completely disappears right up front and then goes right into the background, just as we should when we are in the presence of a holy God. Like any well-planned song, verses, choruses, bridges, we've got that right here in four sections. Verses 46 through 48, praise for what God has done for Mary. Verses 49 and 50, praise for certain attributes of God. Verses 51 through 53, praise for God's sovereign plan of redemption and restoration. And verses 40, 54 through 55, praise of God's remembrance of mercy for His people. She starts her song by saying, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. This line is where we get the title of this song. If you have your Bible open for you, it may say Mary's song, or some of them may say the Magnificat. The Magnificat. The first word in this line, magnify, in the Greek, megale, uh, megalune, is where we get the word exalt or magnify. And the Latin translated word of that is Magnificat. It's where we get that. The Magnificat of Luke. It's Mary's song. It means magnify. My soul 
magnifies the magnificent. Does this sound familiar to you? It should. It should. My soul magnifies the Lord. This is Psalm 34. Magnify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name forever. Taste and see that the Lord is good. She's quoting the first thing that comes out of her mouth is scripture. It's not like, Lord, thank you. My soul magnifies the Lord. Okay, so they sang Psalm 34 in synagogue that week. It was stuck in her head. That's the first thing that, that she had. No, no. I mean, I guess it's possible. But praise God that it was that and not something else. But here's what we need to understand about the Song of Mary. This is the first song of Advent. This is the first song of Christ's coming to the world to redeem fallen man. The first song we have of Him coming as Savior is not arbitrary by no means because nothing is. He is sovereign. It's not some holy rhetoric thought up by Mary so she sounds nice and pious, nice and holy in front of her, her relatives who were both righteous. The song of Mary, rather, is nothing but Scripture saying back unto the Lord. Because what do we have that is our own? Nothing. The song of the sovereignly chosen peasant girl who would give birth to the Savior is a display of Isaiah 55, 11 coming to pass. Her song is God's word, not returning to him void. The song of Mary, the magnificent song of Mary, is a song of pure scripture. None of it is random. None of it is arbitrary. This poor but obviously intelligent young woman hid scripture in her heart and the Holy Spirit caused it to well up in her because all things are from him, through him, and to him. Romans 11.36 Look at this song. Look at this. Open your Bibles. In 10 verses, there are direct quotes or allusions to approximately 12 books of the Old Testament. 12. The most notable comes from 1 Samuel 2, which is also another song, which is also about another child, and it's the song of Hannah. If you remember, Hannah was very much like Elizabeth. She was barren. She had prayed for a child and prayed and prayed and yearned, and the Lord graciously fulfilled this desire of her heart in an act, and in an act of thankfulness and kindness, Hannah dedicates this child unto God, this child, Samuel. He, she dedicates him unto being a priest, and he would be the very priest who would anoint the King David, the throne that Jesus would sit on for forever. Listen to, to Hannah's song in 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, and there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were filled will have hired themselves out for bread for bread and those who are hungry have ceased to hunger the barren has borne seven and she who has had many children is forlorn the lord kills and brings to life he brings down to sheol and he raises up the lord makes poor and makes rich he brings low and he exalts he raises up the poor from the dust he lifts up the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor for the pillar of the earth are the lord's and on them he has set the world he will guard the feet of his faithful ones but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness for not by might shall a man prevail the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken into pieces against them he will thunder in heaven the Lord will judge the ends of the earth he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed the beauty of this is right here the beauty of this song the beauty of what Mary is singing is this the song of Mary, this magnificent song, this should have been Elizabeth's song. This barren woman who has wanted a child and the reproach is taken away from her, why didn't she sing this? She inspired to sing this. This should have been her song. 
Because we know that the baby in Mary's room is the true priest of God, the true Samuel dedicated unto the Lord that intercedes for his people forever, the perfect priest for us, beloved. It's fascinating to note that Hannah's song of thanksgiving in the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament called the the Targum was considered a prophecy about the Messiah, not just a song of thanksgiving, like, oh, she's really happy, she's having a baby. No, it was a prophecy. And if, if that tradition is true, then it would seem that the song of Mary is declaring that the Messianic hope would come, and it has come. So hear the song of Mary again, tuned in, and realize it's not her own words, but the Lord's. Here's some of the allusions. My soul magnifies the Lord, beginning in verse 46. Psalm 34. And not only Psalm 34, but Psalm 6930. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify Him with thanksgiving. 47. My spirit has rejoiced in my Savior. Habakkuk 3.18 Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. 48. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Psalm 138.6 For the Lord is high, for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Verse 48. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Genesis 30, verse 13. And Leah said, Happy am I, for women have called me happy, so she shall call his name Asher. Blessed. 49, For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Zephaniah 3.17, The Lord your God is in your midst, the mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt you over, he will exalt over you with loud singing. Verse 49, holy is his name. Psalm 111, 9. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Verse 50, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Deuteronomy 5, 9 and 10. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Verse 51. He has shown the strength of his arm. Isaiah 51, 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Verse 51 uh, again. He has, sh- he has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. Proverbs 3, 34. To the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. He scatters them. He shatters them. Verse 52. He has brought the mighty down from their thrones. Job 12, 19. He leads priests stripped away and overthrows the mighty. And exalted at those of humble estate. Ezekiel 21, 26. Thus says the Lord God, remove the turban, take off the crown. Things shall not remain as they are. Exalt that which is low and bring low which that, that which is exalted. 53. He has, healed the, he has filled the hungry with good things. Psalm 107, 9, For He satisfies the longing soul and hungry soul. He fills with good things. 54, He has helped His servant Israel. Isaiah 41, 8 through 10, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its furthest corner, saying to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We sing that still today with the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. In remembrance of His mercy, Psalm 98, 3, He has remembered His steadfast love and His faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. 55, as He spoke to our fathers, Micah 7, 20, You will show faithfulness to Jacob and its steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from days of old, to Abraham and his offspring forever. Genesis 15, 4 through 6. And behold, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son 
shall be your heir. And the Lord brought Abraham outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then the Lord said to Abraham, So shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord credited it to him as righteousness. This little song of Mary is packed full of Scripture. Nothing about it is her own. What could she say that was her own? This situation that she was in was not her own. Sure, when we look at Mary's song, we hear so much on the surface. Oh, this is great, but it's like an iceberg. 80% of the mass is below the water. This young peasant girl, by the direction of the Holy Spirit, and I believe in faithful joy, because she had been raised on the Word, became a wellspring of Scripture. Her tongue did not recite words that she had made up. Her tongue was wet with the words of God. This morning, as we close our first Lord's Day of Advent, I want to ask you this. What can we learn from Mary's song more than we ever could in one sermon? We could stop here and go full Martin Lloyd-Jones and preach on this for a year, two years, ten. God is a saving God? Yes, we could talk about that. That's what Advent is all about. Christ's coming to save sinners. God from eternity past, choosing to save for himself a people who would rebel against him and saving them with his strong arm, not by making them work, not by what they do, but by he taking on flesh, living the life that they were supposed to and dying the death they deserved, lying in the tomb that was theirs, then raising to life on the third day for their justification, followed by his glorious ascension to the right hand of the Father on his throne where he rules and reigns right now sovereignly until every enemy is put underneath of his feet. And we proclaim that in the gospel and we fulfill that in the Great Commission by his power, not by ours. He's a mighty God who saves with a humble gospel. But that's not what we want to talk about. Take that with you. Talk about the promises made to Abraham. They're all finding their yes in Jesus. Or we could talk about this. If we examined any of these worthy truths, we would miss the forest for the trees. We don't really understand that gospel proclamation. We don't really understand the faithfulness of God unto Abraham if we do not know this, the Scriptures, if we do not know the Word of God. I ask you this morning, Christian saint, look unto Mary and then look unto yourself. Are the Scriptures written upon your heart in the way that they are with Mary in this scene? Do they... Do they flow out of you so naturally? Is your tongue wet with them that they flow, that the Scriptures flow, that the words of God flow off of your tongue? Do you meditate upon them day and night? Is your language filled and embellished with Scripture? Do you hunger for God's Word? Do you hunger to study it, to commit your heart to it and it to your heart, to learn about it, to understand it better? to have it be your true food? Do you long to sing it? We do here. Or do you simply use the language of Scripture to bless your food and bless your sleep? You must remember that man cannot live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Christian parents, let me speak to you in application for a moment. One moment. Do you know why this probably teenaged girl named Miriam, who most likely did not have much education, was able to rejoice in the God of her salvation with so much Scripture? Was it the Holy Spirit? No doubt. But you must remember that the child in her womb would one day say when he was older that the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance what we've been taught by the Lord. Parents, Mary was able to sing a song not her own, but full of Scripture, because I believe 
the Bible, the scriptures were branded on her heart from her own family that she was righteous because God calls her righteous. She had seemingly been raised on the scriptures, it would seem. She naturally sang them in a moment of jubilee. She heard them at home. She heard them by the way. Christian parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, nieces, mimis, ninis, mamas, poppies, whoever you are, hear this. Hear this. If the only time your kids ever hear scripture is at church, you're failing your job. You're failing your calling. It is your God-given duty to raise up children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, listen to your instruction. Listen to the instruction of the Scriptures. And may your instruction be the fear of the Lord. And would you give your children that? Would you pass it on to them? Mothers, would you raise up children that would raise up and call you blessed because you have washed them with the living water and give them the true word, uh, the food of the word each day? Church, today we must know that the Song of Mary it's an example to all of us, whether we're five or 95. It is an example to all of us. It's an example for us to yearn and long for the scriptures. Church, I pray the seed that is planted in us today is a magnific magnificent magnification, alliteration, of the glory of God in Christ and the glory of God in His Word. I pray that this seed of desiring to be in the Word would go deep into the soil of our hearts. I pray that it gives way and springs forth like a mustard seed in every single one of you, no matter where you at in your walk, that you love God's Word, you desire to be in it, whether you're listening to it, whether you're reading it, and you're passing it on to your children, you're passing it on to your coworkers, whether they want it or not, it will not return to the Lord void. Be like that so when no matter what you go through, whether it's having something vandalized, whether it's a hospital visit that's unexpected, whether it's a great day, a bad day, the first thing that comes from your mouth is a song of praise unto the Lord for His sovereignty and His mercy. May the song of your soul never be simply for entertainment or attention for yourself. Like Mary, may the song of your soul be forevermore the word of the Lord that you simply speak back to him for it, there is a message behind the music we know this there is so let our message be the scriptures that declare the wonderful works of God from creation to fall to salvation to eternity may our lives be but one big symphony composed like the song of Mary with the crescendo of the peace being nothing but Christ amen, amen. grace and peace to you let's pray